please welcome the chair of Van City's Board of Directors, Virginia Weiler. The place we can see her. The place I can see her. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see yeah, such a full house. I think I'll just ask if um, people are wandering in, if you could take your seats and uh, we'll get started. Look, it's so quiet now you can hear a pin drop. So good evening on behalf of Van City's Board of Directors. We want to welcome you to this very special evening in celebration of our 65th anniversary. It's a milestone in Van City's history of serving our members and communities as a progressive financial cooperative. I want to acknowledge um, all of you and, uh, and including all of our past board members, many of whom are here tonight. Um, your groundwork has really laid um, the, the future of the vision that we share at Van City today. And before we start, I'd also really like to acknowledge that we are gathering in the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people who've been custodians of this land for thousands of years. At Van City, we began 65 years ago with 14 members. Today, we serve over 400,000 in 59 branches and $15 billion in assets. We're now Canada's largest credit union, working together with you, our members, to make good money, to build your wealth, and that of communities where we live and work, so that we can all thrive in an environment that includes social justice, environmental sustainability, and community well-being. This evening promises to be thought-provoking and filled with inspiring dialogue. It's no mistake that we asked Paul Hawken, an environmentalist, an entrepreneur, an author, to be our guest speaker tonight. His commitments and values are very much aligned with the way we do business at Van City. His work includes starting ecological businesses, writing about the impact of commerce on living systems, and consulting with heads of states and CEOs on economic development, industrial ecology, and environmental policy. Please join me in a warm welcome for Paul Hawken as he shares his thoughts on how we can all leverage our wisdom, money, and humanity I, for a better I, world. I, 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 no Welcome, Paul Hawking. Thank you so much. You did great. Wow. I did a sound check an hour ago, and I told Al uh, and Virginia that as a speaker, you get a, a venue like this once in a decade. This quality audience, this quality building, this quality sound, it's just such a blessing, such a gift. Thank you for being here tonight. I'd also like to add my respect and acknowledge uh, the traditional inhabitants and the custodians of the lands uh, that we meet on tonight and people who sustain this land for thousands of years, of course. The elders past and present of the Musqueam, <clears throat> Slavatooth, and the Squamish people. I want to get back to them in a minute. Um, this wasn't just a perfunctory acknowledgement. It's core to what I want to communicate tonight. Um, environmentalists are often accused of um, moving the goalposts. Um, just when you think you know what the problem is, they turn up and move it, and it's worse than you thought. And um, I don't want to lose you tonight as an audience. You've come here. It's a beautiful evening. I don't want you to leave unhappy, but I also want to apologize in advance if I happen to move the goalposts down the field a little bit. Science is changing very rapidly, um, and the more we know about the environment, the more we know uh, about the spatial and temporal dynamics uh, of ecosystems and species, uh, particularly in the area of climate and oceans, 
Um, the air is getting hotter, hotter, the news is not getting better, uh, and all the earlier predictions uh, are now outdated and seem pale. Um, I first though want to say something about sustainability. It's a word that's Delphic in its meanings and definitions. Um, it's a must-use term. It's a useful one because it is used so much. Um, it is used by different people and different organizations in different ways. Um, but I want to say fundamentally it is not a fix. It's not a department. It's not a discipline. Um, it, it's not even an adjective. Um, recently, I was at the Westin Hotel in uh, Baltimore, and I don't know if it's you, some of you probably go to hotels and you have that cute little card, you know, you're unpacking, you're going to the bathroom, there's this little card that says, hey, do you want to save the earth? And you say, well, sure, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you just put your towel up on the rack, you know, and, and we won't change the towel, you know. And um, so I collect these. I want to know who writes them. They're so... Um, Charming. And, <laughs> and the one in the Western Hotel had a picture of the double shower head that they have in the showers, two big double heads, and said, if you want to save the earth, turn one of the heads off, you know. And so I thought, I want to see what they put in when you rent a Corvette or a Maserati. What does the little thing say? Or when you go to you know, a five-star hotel, whatever. I mean, somehow sustainability has creeped out to mean nothing at all. And it means so much. And the thing about sustainability is that it's hardwired. It's instinctive. All of us know as individuals what sustainability is. Every species does. Uh, it's the extension of our life as far as possible. It's what we do as individuals. It doesn't matter whether we're animals or people. And we know it. If I ask you to pick, pick up a rattlesnake, you won't do it. Why? Because it's, it's hardwired. You don't even have to think about it. So the, when we talk about sustainability, what we're talking about is the societal concept of sustainability and the tension between what we do as individuals, which it does not collectively and cumulatively amount to a world that is sustained or equitable or fair in which living systems are not dying. You know. And that's the tension, that gap is what we talk about. To me, the, the very core of, of the wound, the very core of the problem goes back to this acknowledgement of the people who were the original inhabitants of this land. And that is what indigenous means. It means original inhabitant, first inhabitants, indigene. And that wound is prominent in the West. And that wound is that we think we're separate from nature, that we think we're other. And now every child who's born knows that that's not true. <laughs> every child thinks in terms of systems. Every child sees for uh, almost two years, maybe, you know, their mother as themselves. You know. If you ask a child, should we spend more money on missiles, or should we provide food for every child that's starving on Earth? They get the answer right. Should there be jobs for every man and woman who need them, and, or should the people of Goldman Sachs make more money? I mean, if you ask them the simple binary questions about poverty, water, food, livelihood, health care, housing, they get it right every time. It takes 12 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to educate our children not to know the truth. Right? It's what we do. And we harm them that way. Right? So David Suzuki is very good about this point that nature is not outside. You know? And the duality of modernity and nature uh, is the opposite of the indigenous worldview. Now I'm going to ask you to do something right now, which is I want to trace sustainability right back to your body. And in your body uh, are a quadrillion cells, but only 10% of them are human cells. Right? The other 90% are not 
human cells. They're bacteria, a little bit of virus going in. So you are a community. It's a terrible blow to the ego. Because <laughs> you probably thought you're maybe a little good looking and professional and probably smarter than average, you know. But in fact, it's not true. You are a community. And that's just your narrative. <laughs> it's not true. You know. And every cell has 400 billion molecules in it. 400 billion. Can you imagine? And every millisecond within your body, there's one septillion activities going on. Okay. That's a one with 24 zeros. It's 10 times more than all the stars in the known universe. And my question for you is, can you feel it? Seriously. You're looking a little puzzled. <laughs> really, can you feel it? If you are puzzled, think about this. Wait until you die and compare the difference. <laughs> right? You can feel it. And the reason you can't identify it is because you've always felt it just like fish cannot identify water. But we are life, and our life depends on the life of 900 trillion other beings inside us. Right now, if without them, you die and perish quickly. Right? So the second question I have for you is, who is in charge of your body? Hopefully not a political party. <laughs> but who's managing it? Because right? if you tried to manage it, you would also die. Right? No one is managing the life processes of the body. And what this brings to the fore is Janine Benyus, biologist Jean Benyus, wonderful definition and really expression of what life is. And life creates the conditions that are conducive to life. It's what life does. That's what all those cells are doing inside you, despite those double shot, half calf, you know, no foam, caramel lattes, <laughs> and everything else you fudge on. I mean, it will, no matter what you do, those cells will try to create the conditions that are conducive to life. It's what life does. Can you think of a better definition of what a political system should do, an economic system should do, what a government should do, what a city should do, what a community should do. It creates the conditions that are conducive to life. That's what we should do. Right? It's so simple. And we do that as mothers and fathers, as parents. We do that. It's not a mystery to us. It's just when we get to the whole, to the collective of humanity, we fail. Why? I don't know. 117 years ago, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I've greatly come to admire, um, wrote in his journal these words, and I want to read them to you. He said, if I go into the forest, I find all new and undescribed. Nothing has been told me. The screaming of the wild geese never heard, the thin note of the titmouse and his bold ignoring of the bystander the fall of the flies that patter on the leaves like rain, the angry hiss of some bird that crepitated at me yesterday. The formation of turpentine and indeed any vegetation, any animation, any and all are alike undescribed. Each man that goes into the wood seems to be the first man that ever went into the wood. Nature grows over me, frogs pipe, Waters far off tinkle, dry leaves hiss, grass bends and rustles. It goes on. Now, when I first, when I first read this, I thought, wow, what was he smoking? <laughs> so transcendent. This is the, you know, the, the father of the American transcendentalist movement, all right? But the more I read it and the more I read his journals, I began to flip that question. Is that an altered state of consciousness? 
Or is that a normal state of consciousness? And it is we who have an altered state of consciousness, a state of consciousness that tells us that we're separate from life. That is the altered state. Right? So could it be that we have become and we're conditioned to be someone we are not? And sustainability, in the deepest, most profound sense of that word, is asking us to become the person we are. And the question you have to ask, perhaps, is are the exigencies or the issues or the problems which are getting worse by the day that you were very literate about or you wouldn't be here, are they happening to us or are they happening for us? And I choose for us, not to be Pollyannish, but in that mode, I am free and I am empowered. If I happens to me, I am in fear, I'm a victim, and I'm reactive. So sustainability, the call to it, the cause of it, is a call for humanity to become human beings again. That's all it is, humane beings, right? And is it complex? Yes, very complex. But it could it be, and it goes back to the beginning of my talk, could it be that the people, the First Nations, who were scorned, humiliated, here in America, hunted down, pillaged, extirpated, raped, murdered, could they, in fact, actually hold the key, the simple key to our passage into this sane and equitable world. And the key has been obvious from the outset. And it's embedded in every sentence and prayer that you see from First Peoples. And that the metaphors that we use and are used by indigenous people about our mother and our father, our mother earth, our father's son, grandmother, grandfather, etc., that these were not poetic devices. They were the experience of a culture that had no grammar, had no syntax for the duality of man and nature. And what sustainability is calling us to do is come back to that knowing, to that experience, which is innate in all of us. Right? Emerson imagined religion and science you know, as one field of thought. He didn't see science and nature as separate. There was no elisions and so forth. You know, He said nature had become the metaphor of the human mind. I don't think it's even the metaphor. The mind is nature. You know? And he anticipated modern brain science in seeing that the human mind was not some tabula rasa in which we inscribe our biases and our education and our culture. But in the words of Stephanie Marshall, it is a magnificent, pattern-seeking, complex living system, our mind, a complex living system whose structures are never fixed, right? Never fixed. So there are four conditions, you know them well, that have brought us to this point. The, the, they are population, living systems, the economy, and climate and energy. And population, was it? Two weeks ago, the UN said the seventh billion person arrived. And we know that the impact we have per person compared to, say, 7,000 years ago is 1,000 times greater. And we know there's 1,000 times more people. So we know that we have more impact on the planet in five minutes than the people who lived here five, in 5,000 BC did in a whole year. In other words, the impact has accelerated asymptotically. To give you a sense of what that means practically, we have to grow the same amount of food in the next 40 years as we did in the last 8,000 years to feed everybody, right? Huge impact, huge change. And with living systems, again, it, I could talk about this living system, that ocean, this coral reef, 
this riparian corridor, this mangrove system, this topsoil, this valley, this desertification. The fact is that every living system on our Earth is in decline, and the decline is accelerating. That's it. You need no more. That's it. Every living system is in decline, and the rate of decline is accelerating. And with respect to the economy, gosh, you know, what, what can I say that the headlines don't say right now? But I will say this, and that is that there's much discussion of the capitalist system. I come at it a little tangentially, which is I don't think we have one. I don't think we ever did. A capitalist system is you spend the income from your capital and reinvest it to increase capital. That's capitalism. We are liquidating our capital as fast as we can. We're having a once in a billion year blowout sale of carbon and no reasonable offer is being refused, right? That's not capitalism, right? We spend $4 billion, $4 billion a day to subsidize primary extractive industries. We have a pricing system that's stealing the future, selling it in the present, calling it GDP, and patting itself on the back, you know? We're using more and more of what we have less of, which is natural capital, resources, in order to do what? To use less and less of what we have more of. In other words, we're using more resources to make people more productive, and we have chronic unemployment around the world. We have a billion people who cannot work, who want to work. And we are taught, if we go to Wharton, if we go to the University of Chicago, we're taught as economists that this is natural, that this is part of an economic system. Why is it that we're the only species on Earth that doesn't have full employment? Really, how brilliant is that? <laughs> and yet we teach this as a science, you know? It's a failure of imagination. It is not a science, and so forth. And, and then we're told that education and clean energy, um, environmental restoration, Universal health care, th th these are too expensive, right? The elimination of poverty, great idea, but it costs a lot, you know? Hmm. It's just, that can never be true. It simply never is true. What is true is that it's, the ability to do harm is too cheap. That's what's inexpensive. <laughs> It's so easy to harm. So this is an economic system that's upside down and backwards. And for the past 40 years, past 40 years, I mean, we have stimulated economic growth by growing money and credit. And, and what is that like? What's the analogy for that? It's like herbicides. Do you, some of you know how herbicides work. They're hormones. They're not, they don't kill. They make plants grow really fast. That's what they do. They grow so fast, they outstrip their capacity to take up water and nutrients, and they die. That's how our herbicide works. And that's what 40 years of bizarre means of credit creation and money creation has done to the earth, which is we have grown too fast, too much, and we've outstripped our capacity to take up nutrients. We've created economic polarization. This hormonal monetary and credit growth is now a debt emergency of monumental pr proportion. And if there were a solution to this crisis, we would have known it by now. Right? The best minds have been working on this since 2008. And the reason there's no solution is because there's no solution. The banking system is insolvent. I'm not sure, bank. But the system. <laughs> that's what this evening's about. It's like <laughs> but really, Europe, take a look, read it, do the math. Insolvent. American banks, Bank of America, insolvent. Goldman Sachs has a 537 to 1 debt to liability uh, equity ratio, I mean asset ratio. Give me a break. What are we talking here? What are we talking about here? Extraordinary. It makes the idea that their casinos are gambling pale in compar comparison to what has happened 
during the last 40 years. And it's come out. It was happening all along, right? So Aristotle's money creates phony economy, sham growth, unscrupulous politics, income polarization, bogus prosperity, right? And that's all coming to an end. And no country will escape this financial crisis. It doesn't matter if Canada has been fiscally prudent because the countries that print money, and they have to print money to service unserviceable debts, will then have currencies that are depreciated, and you're going to be caught up, as the rest of the world is, in competitive currency devaluation. It's, it's already happening. Switzerland had to, had to hit their currency, had to devalue the Swiss franc, the gold standard of currencies, right? Because of the euro, right? So what's going to happen here? Right? No question. And the outcome is either, is binary. It's either deflation and collapse or inflation, huge inflation. I hesitate to use the word hyperinflation. I don't know what's going to happen. But there's no way out. It's either you actually pay the piper now or you make play money. That's it. Because the debts that have been created you know, are not serviceable. And I've always wondered, you know, and I think a lot of environmentalists wonder, especially in the last 20, 30 years, you know, do they be talking about, you know, we're running out of stuff here, and we're having to peak this, and peak this, and peak that, and then you go, well, yeah, and somebody would say, yeah, but I'm making a lot of money, and God, you know, people are building new homes, and cars are getting bigger and better, and you know, you environmentalists just sound like Chicken Little. And there was this lag between the financial system and what natural systems were telling us, and now they're coming together. So, while Van City cannot control the value of currency, they do control, and you can control the flow of currency. So important. It's only by regionalizing capital flows can you create true sustainability and maintain resiliency, redundancy, capacity, job creation, and some semblance, if not the actuality, of food security, energy security, and material security. It can't be done in any other way. You know? So this is it here in this room, sitting next to you. Sustainability isn't somewhere else out there in that beautiful cold night. It's here. This is you. Right? So the people in the villages and the towns of this world need to bring their money home, right? It's just that simple. Every town is a transition town because we're on a transition planet. And we absolutely need to prepare ourselves for a robustly you know, local and interdependent economy. And yes, those who get ahead, those who start, the farmers and the people who try to localize businesses that have been highly centralized and mass-produced are marginalized. It's hard for them to make money. And you need to step up, and you are. Support them. They need credit. And what's happened in this caving, imploding credit collapse in the world is that credit has dried up. It's just dried up. You can't get it. And you can here from Van City. And this is not an ad. This is like saying, this is, this is what, it is an ad, isn't it? But this makes sense, right? But I'm not being romantic here. And this is so important to do and to think about, right? The other driver is climate and energy. Now, with climate, I had the opportunity um, two years ago to go on a royal fact-finding mission to um, northern Greenland. And I went, um, was invited by the Prince of Denmark. And I, I want to tell you, as an English major, I was so thrilled. <laughs> it's like, finally. <laughs> he wasn't at all like Hamlet, I want to tell you. He's such a nice guy. And the Princess of Sweden and the Prince of, um, Norway, Prince Haakon, it's not spelled like that, and um, 
Princess Victoria, they were just uh, extraordinary people, young people. They care deeply about what's happening. They want to know the uh, global warming is occurring more rapidly, as you know, in the north as it is in temperate latitudes. Um, and so we all went to Greenland, and we went in a naval vessel, and then a Congolusic, we took a C-130 from the Schenectady National Guard in, in New York um, to the North uh, Emian Ice Research Station uh, in the very north of Greenland. Now, you land there with pylons and a whiteout. There's really nothing there. There's not one single human artifact within 500 kilometers, not even a candy bar wrapper. And you know why, as soon as you step out of the plane, because nothing can survive there. There is nothing there. There's ice, that's it. Not even a rock. And the purpose of the ice research center is to drill down. And when you get there, you see some tents, you see a geodesic dome, you see a container that has a generator and diesel fuel in it, and you see this cave or this hole, you go down, and you go down into this amazing world that they've set up over the years as a scientific laboratory and the basis for them to drill down ultimately 8,334 feet to hit bedrock. And why are they doing this? They're doing it because it uh, presents a perfect forensic record of climate and CO2 over the past 125,000 years because when you get to the bottom, you get to the Eemian period. And in the Eemian period, there was hippopotami lounging around in the Thames swamp. It was not a river. There was, uh, uh, the water was 13 to 20 feet higher at that time. Uh, elephants and giraffes and lions and zebra were cavorting across Germany. Uh, alligators were in Alaska munching on what alligators munch on. Um, it was a very, very different world. That's 450 parts per million. Sounds great for the animals. Um, a little different for us. It doesn't mean in 39 years we hit that climate regime, not at all. It took a, lot, a long time for it to hit that in the Indian period. But what you get there is the, the, the diligence and the courage of these scientists. The week before, a person had been there for 10 years and who knew everything and knew about survival, what to do, what not to do. Uh, went out slightly underdressed, should never do that. It was 30 below when we were there. Went out, white out, got lost, did what you, he knows you're not supposed to do, which is to try to find your way back instead of waiting where he was. And they found him a day later, and he's a double amputee, right? I mean, it's, you're there for 90 days, and then you're out of there. Scientists from 14 nations, comparing data with the people in uh, uh, Antarctica, pulling out these amazing, amazing uh, four-meter ice cores and coming out. It's, they use coconut milk as a lubricant. It comes out. It looks like a Hollywood B movie. You can look them down, six stories, and this thing, blub, 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 with coconut milk spilling out. Like, where is it coming from? And they bring it up, and they put it laterally, put it on these benches and so forth. And then they can do this readout, and they can tell you exactly what happened in that age, or this time, or this year, by pollen, by isotopes, by the, the, the amount of uh, SO2, everything. When there was a volcanic eruption, how big it was, whether it was southern or northern hemisphere. Brilliant, brilliant science. And what, what occurs to me when I came back to the United States, I was just in Australia, is the political rhetoric about climate change, about it being a belief system. Like, oh, I don't believe in climate change, you know? <laughs> really. I mean, we don't understand phys the physics of gravity yet either, you know? And I wish, w would you jump out of a high rise because we don't understand the physics of gravity, you know? Probably not, right? But somehow, the physics of climate change is excusable. But what I want to suggest here is we take back the language, because it is not us who are believers. We are skeptics. We are skeptical that the climatic stability we've had for 8,000 years will, will go forward. We don't think it's going to happen. Right? They are the believers. They're the true believers, not us. 
We have no data to suggest that the climate is going to remain as it has been going forward, or even is already, right? So when we talk about climate, we have to talk about energy. And energy is big in this country. We just delayed the Keystone XL pipeline for a little while. They want to come through British Columbia now. I think you saw that. I hope you stopped them if they come this way towards you. Um, the, we know the, the total proven reserves of oil. There are 1.4 trillion barrels of oil. What we do know is that we used 20% of all the oil we combusted during the Bush administration. It could have been the Bugs Bunny administration. I'm not saying what kind of was, actually. Come to think of it. But, I'm not saying it was Bush. I'm just saying is that was the, the rate of consumption, right? We use 50% of all the oil we've consumed in the past 25 years, 50%, okay? And we have about 35 years left of consumption at a present rate of oil use going forward, okay? Now, the biggest oil discovery in the past 30 years was the Tupi and Santos fields, 160 miles off Brazil, two miles down to a salt dome, a mile through a salt dome in which you have to use drill bits that can withstand 2,000 degrees centigrade. And down there, underneath that, is 40 billion barrels of oil. Okay, it'll take 10 years and hundreds of billions of dollars to get that oil out, and it'll last the world for 15 months. That's it. And that's what we face in terms of our energy future. Now, the physicist uh, Saul Griffith um, did something, and I encourage you to do the same thing, which is play with how to change the sources of energy. We hear talk about clean tech, about renewables. We'll get a pencil and paper and do the math. Right now, the world uses 16 terawatts of energy. And it is estimated that 20% of that can still be carbon-based in some form or another. So the other 80% has to be eliminated in terms of being carbon-based. And has to be done within 25 years in order to level out at 450 parts per million. Right? And to do that means that we have to produce 200 square meters of 15% solar PV every second for 25 years, 50 square meters of solar mirrors for solar thermal every second for 25 years. We have to produce six three megawatt uh, wind turbines per hour for 25 years. We have to produce 200 megawatt geothermal plants every day for 25 years. And we have to produce one three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week for 25 years, assuming we use no more energy in 25 years than we're using today. And if you don't like nuclear, like me, take it off and figure out what you're going to put instead. OK. So I'm so glad you clapped. Most people get really depressed when I say this. <laughs> And, you know, it's like we say, yeah, we've got to change, we've got to change. You say, okay, here's the change. People, oh, shoot, man, that's a, that's a lot. That, it is a lot. It is a lot. You know. Is it impossible? Not at all. But it sure is impossible if you don't believe in climate change, right? Given this situation, you know, with water, with oceans, with climate, with finance, food, energy, and economy, who are you going to call? The IMF? Our Congress? The IEA? The UN? The Vatican? Goldman Sachs? Exxon? Imperial Oil? Who are you going to call? I'm seriously. Who? I mean, we got a big problem here. Who are you going to, who, who are you going to turn to? I, there's no cynicism here. I'm just, honestly, like, give me the 800 number. We have a problem, excuse me. You know, can you help? Oh, oh really? Oh, you're, you're ruining the place. Okay, thanks. I'll, 
It's like, there is no big institution that we can call, call upon. In fact, as we well know, if they're not exacerbating the situation, they're the cause. And these are hierarchical institutions, right, based on power. They're male-dominated. They're power over institutions, right? So that's not the answer. And to address these issues, and that's energy just one of the issues, is incalculably difficult. And the stats tell us that what the world needs is basically impossible, right, in the time frame that we need to do it. Restore spaceship Earth in a generation, essentially. Stop all further destruction of the environment. Feed 9 to 10 billion people while restoring the forests, reefs, the wetlands, and the topsoil, and make it a carbon sink instead of a carbon source. You know, lower the thermostat. You know, curb carbon emissions 80% in 25 years. Alleviate poverty. Raise the standard of living for 5 billion people, and reduce our impact on resources and living systems. Now, if this was a play, the author would be winning a Pulitzer. <laughs> Because in every play, the protagonists are introduced in Act 1, and by the time you get to Act 2, you know the protagonist is screwed. <laughs> right? I mean, gone. And you go out in the lobby in intermission, thinking, what's going to happen? You know, and you have your wine or popcorn or whatever, and you come back to find out. Well, this is Act 3, okay. And it is like a play. And this is Act 3. What's going to happen? And, you know, for years, uh, when I, and I've been active in this area for, for a long time, people would turn to me and say, you know, I think we need a spiritual awakening. And I go, yeah, but we haven't got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, we do, but <laughs> we have a job to do, right? And I kind of felt like an annoying, cloying, new age California thing. Oh, we need a spiritual awakening. Well, actually... I thought about it, and the, and, the, and the thing that really provoked me to think about it in a different way was Karen Armstrong's book, um, The Great Transformation. It's a beautiful book. I recommend it. And she talks about the actual age in 200 to 900 BCE. And during that time, a time of great violence and barbarity and cruelty and suffering, there arose sages and philosophers and teachers of all around, from Greece all the way through India and China. Right. A very different type of teaching. And rather than creating religious institutions, these teachers were bringing forth social movements. They became, their teachings became religions. They were not teaching religion. Right? They were trying, and their objective was to create an entirely different human being, to reimagine what it means to be a human being. And they were Socrates, and Sophocles, and Lao Tzu, and Confucius, and Mencius, and Buddha, and Rabbi Hillel, right? And like Rabbi Hillel said, you know, never do anything to your neighbor. You would not have your neighbor do to yourself. It was the golden rule. It was enunciated by all of these teachers. This was new <laughs> thinking. And Rabbi Hillel said, that is the Torah. <laughs> all the rest is commentary. Read it. <laughs> Read it. Right? And she writes, Karen Armstrong, the actual sages were not interested in providing their disciples with an edifying uplift after which they could return with renewed vigor to their self-centered lives. You know? Sages insisted that people abandon their egotism and greed, their violence and unkindness. Not only was it wrong to kill another human being, you must not even speak a hostile word about, a, about or towards that person, nor even make an irritable gesture. You know? and your concern must somehow extend to the entire world. If be people behave with kindness and generosity to others, they could save the world, okay? This is what they were teaching, you know? So it occurs to me that we may be in an age of an awakening, 
And to do that, I wanted to find out how many of them are the us. What are we doing? How are we becoming we? And what are we doing all around the world? And so forth. And if you could, I have a tape, a video. And if you could run it, um, uh, I'll talk about it. Um, and what you see here is very simple. All you're going to see is you see a list of organizations, a city, and a state. And there are NGOs, or NPOs, as you call them. There's citizen-based organizations, CBOs, village-based, institutes, coalitions, alliances, networks, foundations, faith-based organizations. Um, and they constitute, in my opinion, humanity's immune response to ecological degradation, political corruption, and economic disease. And I believe the media vastly underestimates the problems we face ahead of us, but it vastly under underestimates the generosity and altruism of humanity as well. These small groups are underfunded everywhere in the world, and they're in every village, city, town, shire, country, state, and tribe. Yes, they're frightened, but they're determined. They're outspent and outgunned. And to give you a sense of how many they are, if you start watching now as you are, you'd have to stay here for a day, 24 hours, and I'd come back and say you have to stay for another day. And after two days, I'd say you have to stay for a week and be watching the names of the organizations. two weeks to say you're halfway to one month, and you have to stay a month. And after I came, at the end of that month, I'd say, you have to stay one more day. You have to sit here 24-7 for two months to see the names of all the organizations in the world and addressing the same issues in the world. That is who we are. It is not how we're portrayed in media. If you look at their mission statements, their goals, their aspirations, you look at them, you put them up on walls, you walk along, read them all, they're all different and none conflict. And this has never happened in the history of humanity. What's happening is unprecedented. For those who say to Occupy, for those who say to this, yeah, but you don't have a leader, you don't know exactly what you want, you don't know what your goals are, I would say that that's a reflection of the world we live in. It's our politicians. It is the heads of our corporations. It is the head of our religions. It is the head of our international banking, you know, World Bank, IMF. Those are the people who don't have a clue as to where they're going, and it shows. Um, I just want to say one more thing, and that is that we have chosen, and we have, you're here, we have chosen to create a restored and sustainable world, not because it's lucrative, you know, not because it furthers our personal prospects, but because it mobilizes our spirit and intelligence. And not, it's not a goal that we can achieve in our lifetime. You know. It's a goal that creates a lifetime. You know. And we do it because we're willing to walk together, you know, and to walk alongside the heartbreak and the fear and to know that we will be defeated again and again by the inertia of this industrial economic system that we have created, that we have created, you know. And to know, to know that the world we love so dearly is not for us. 
It's not for us. You know, it's for the generations to come. And it's for those who will pay an extraordinary price, you know, for the past if we fail. You know, it, it, the, the hardships that they will bear are incalculable. And it's for those who are watching us wondering, you know, whether it'll be more missiles or more school books, you know, right? more military bases or more hospitals, you know, whether we will feed, clothe, and house every person in the world or build more gated communities for the rich, you know, whether it be more dignified living wage jobs for the men and women who deserve them and want them, or there will be more poverty. You know. And this is our blessing to live at this time, to know the scope and the breadth of the problems we face is to know that it's the act three, to know that what we have to do is impossible. And as I said to college graduates a couple years ago, just go do it and check later to see whether it was possible or not. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for that, and thank you for what you do and who you are and for your kindness to this fragile world. I also really want to reach out and thank all the people who organized this event to Virginia, whom you met, and Tamara Vrooman, who will speak soon, the board of directors of Van City, to Thomas Dolan, to uh, David Beers, to all the staff um, uh, at Van City. Um, a talk is no better. Um, than its audience, and I am so <laughs> blessed to have you here tonight, and may you uh, all uh, walk in beauty. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I think um, with a, a power, uh, a passion, and a humility as, uh, as compelling as that which we just heard presented uh, today um, and this evening. We have a lot to be thankful for and a lot uh, to think about, uh, thanks to Mr. Paul Hawkins. So again, join me in please thanking Paul for his very powerful words. You know, as I reflect on what Paul said, um, there's so many uh, powerful learnings, um, not the least of which is that I am a community. Didn't know that before this evening. Uh, and that the power of, of each of us as uh, communities is greater when we come together, uh, when we believe and understand how connected we are to one another, when we don't discard the absolute um, sense of sustainability and sense of belonging that we're each born with. And when we apply that to our business, our personal lives, our community, our craft, we have the power to overcome even the most daunting of challenges. And so it's my distinct pleasure to transition the evening from those thought-provoking words of Mr. Hawken and introduce uh, a facilitator who's gonna bring some local context to us tonight and engage in what I hope will be a dialogue around what we can do in our community to respond to the great opportunity and challenge that is before us in terms of human, compassionate, environmental sustainability. 
And so David Beers is the editor of the TAI, a fabulous publication, our media sponsor this evening, our partner, uh, the source of many thoughtful, objective, real, human, exceptional pieces of journalism that bring ideas and debate in a very real and accessible way to our community. So please join me in welcoming David Beers to the stage. Thank you very much. Paul, fantastic. Thank you. Um, what a privilege to be on the stage with you, Paul. And uh, even if I had to watch half of your talk backstage, <laughs> it, I was very moved and inspired by what you said. You're awfully good at getting people to think about things. So you got me to think about a few things, and I'll share a few of those. But first, I want to um, let everybody know how the rest of the evening is going to go. There's no intermission, so forget it. Um, you're here. Um, <clears throat> secondly, um, Paul and I and you are going to have a conversation for about 20 minutes. You see that there are um, microphones in the aisles. And so if you have uh, questions for Paul, begin formulating them now. And in a minute or two, you'll be able to ask them at the microphones. Um, one of the questions I'd, I'd like you to think about um, or as part of your question, perhaps, um, arises from something that I thought came through many times in your talk tonight. You talked about taking back the language. And one of the phrases that was in your very description of your, of your talk tonight was leveraging, leveraging our humanity and our wisdom and even, yes, our money to make a better world. Right. Leveraging assets, that's hedge fund talk. You know, that's, we're not supposed to talk that way, right? Except leveraging is a very powerful idea. And um, I like the, the fact that the point was made that money is important and money can make change, but we have other assets that we can leverage. We have time mm. and we have wisdom. We have emotional support that we can lend other people. We have the ability to mentor. So as people come up and, and ask their questions of Paul, I just thought it might be kind of interesting this evening if you might want to add a way in which you are leveraging something to make a better world. If that makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to do that, that's OK. Nobody's going to leverage you into doing it. But I think that would be a nice thing to add. Um, and I just wanted to make one more comment. Well, I'm just sort of vamping here while people have time to come up to the microphone. I just want to make one more comment that might have come to mind for some of the people in the audience as well. Um, your metaphor of, of, the, of the cellular structure of the body and the cells working together to maintain and sustain life. Even when you're having a bad day, you have a headache or, or dare I say, a fever. Those are your antibodies actually rallying to preserve and protect your body. I have to say that's how I've perceived the Occupy movement, as a fever. And I know that we're at a critical moment now. Um, the occupiers in, in, in New York were, were cleared out. Um, the Occupy Vancouver scene is at a certain point here. And I just, from a media point of view, I feel like I have a certain sense of how my fellow cellular members of the media are often going to want to interpret that. They're going to want to diminish and scale down what the Occupy movement's been about. They're, to, they're going to want to say that it ended up being a small group of people who were sent packing. And I actually think the challenge of the Occupy movement is to the 99% to respond in 99 different ways, right? To leverage whatever we have to broaden this movement and keep it alive. Because after all, what it was about is a call to the same values that you brought out tonight. You know, yeah. making a more. Um, the themes I'm hearing is, is making the world fairer, closing the divide, well, making I mean, us humane beings, as you said. Uh, from my point of view, in terms of Occupy, this is just the bare beginning, and uh, it is an inchoate, and it is confusing, and, um, but this is just the beginning of something. We don't know what it will become, and we don't know 
if it will matriculate or fail. We don't know if it will morph or change. We don't know if it will succeed. But, but what I would say is that having been you know, part of the activist movement since I was 17, um, I, you know, I was in Selma when Selma, Alabama started, and there was 13-year-olds marching to the James Pettibone Bridge every day and getting beaten up and getting fire hosed and getting hit with truncheons, attacked by German shepherds and dogs and so forth, and they come back every day. They just keep coming back and keep coming back. So to me, the fact that Occupy is cleared out is like, so what? Right. That's just, so what? I mean, you know, I, if I was strategizing, I'd say, actually stay away for the winter, go home, get warm, mm -hmm. and plan. But, mm -hmm. you know, and, co and come back in the spring anyway, I think that would be a good tactical right. thing. Because the, the, the conditions or the issues that are, that are salient, um, which are really about accountability, transparency, uh, honesty, fairness, um, right. not having criminals run the financial system, I mean, those things are not going to go away uh, in the spring, by the springtime. So the tendency of the media to want to kind of marginalize it is, is that's always been true. And I, I just don't see that that's going to be effective. The more you harm or hurt a movement that is actually arising, the stronger it becomes. And so I don't expect it to weaken it at all. I, at the same time, you have to understand that just like in Seattle, 1999, Occupy is attracting marginal people, it's, it's attracting black bloc anarchists, it's attracting hooligans, it's attracting people. I was in Melbourne, I gave a talk, oh, October 24th, I think, and, um, and I came right out from the town hall, and there was Occupy, which was great, and I felt, oh, I'm at home, but, you know, it's like a, talking to people, but I also saw that kind of wild, methadrine crazed look in, in some young people who just, you know, wanted to, to be somebody that day, you know, and that kind of training, that nonviolent training uh, is, is, is probably missing, you know, and it needs to be instilled. There needs to be some way to uh, uh, educate people that, that it doesn't work, you know, that, that anger doesn't work. And so I think as the conversation <laughs> as the conversation will necessarily focus on tactics and immediate outcomes and the feel of these particular sites of con conflict and contestation, the broader challenge to all of us is how do we take up the general call, right? I mean, how do we, each in our own lives, take on this challenge to close the gap and make, make a world for humane beings, right? So yeah, and I think that's what Occupy, it's really about witnessing, it's about presence, it's about showing up, it's about, and, and again, you know, that's how it started, and I think that's how it's going to spread. Um, but the, the thing about nonviolence, and, and that it, I think is often lost, is it's not about nonviolence, which is like, well, like, you know, peace is the absence of war. That's not peace. Nonviolent is when you march or are marched upon and you face um, policemen and with their plexiglass shields and they've covered up their badge numbers and they have big shields and polycarbonate sticks and, you know, tear gas here and pepper spray there and, you know, um, uh, guns that shoot rubber bullets, basically. And you're, you face them, and, and nonviolence is about not seeing them as other and, and loving them. And, and, and I see we have a lot of people waiting to ask you questions, okay. so I don't want to take okay. their time. Let's start over here. Me? Yep. Hey, this is uh, really a local question. Uh, my name is Mark Weiler. Uh, one of the things I routinely use is my access rights available through freedom of information legislation. But this is something that our generation is the first generation to have. Historically, no other generation in the world, other than save Sweden, has had the right to access documents in the custody of our government. This has spread around the world exponentially in the last 20 years. And I'm proud to say that in my family history, I'm the first Weiler to ever use the right to access documents. I spoke to my grandmother recently and talked about the first time her, uh, her mother voted when she was given that franchise to vote. And what I'm finding is that civil society 
still doesn't aware of their access rights and the tremendous power that this has to say that we can participate in our democracy, that we can take a stand. And recently, in the Thai EU, it was announced that the DC uh, government has not published mandatory annual reports on the Freedom of Information Protection mm. and Privacy Act for the last 16 years. <laughs> this is a democratic right that enables all to stand up and say, this is the society that we want. So how do we stand up and recognize the tremendous rights that we have that we've been granted and use it to bring about the change that we so desperately need? You just did. <laughs> no, no, I'm not being facetious. You just did. And that's how you do it. There is no other way. And to use the passion which you have, the knowledge you have, the, the fact that you care so much about this and talk about leverage, no one is better equipped and better suited to actually create this awareness that transparency is available and being untapped. You know? and, 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 and really, this emblematic of this whole movement, because everybody, all these organizations you saw and didn't see, arise by default. They arise because somebody isn't doing something that should. The government didn't publish for so many years, right? 16 years, whatever it was. Like, and what happens is you look around to left, to right, you say, well, why isn't somebody doing this? And you find out nobody is, and then you do it. And maybe you form an organization. Maybe it's a dot, dot org, you know, with one person but a great website. Maybe it's a bunch of people. Maybe it, it networks out, so you create, you know, sister organizations throughout the Canada and throughout the United States. All these things, that's what we're seeing, is morphing and changing and using the, the transparency and the information that's available now that has never been available before. And that's why you're seeing flat, hierarchical organizations here in the movement, is because they don't need top-down, because top-down was the politicization of information. And lateral is everybody's got the access to information. So decision making is very different process. Anyway, so I just think you're exemplary of what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, let me add, I, I began to describe to you how the evening was going to go, but I didn't finish. I wanted to let you know that uh, after about 20 more minutes of this, or 15 or so, then um, three local um, social entrepreneurs are going to join us on stage and, and explain how they've leveraged all kinds of different aspects of being a humane being uh, to create a better world. So um, how about all the way, the, the second microphone there in the back, you. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I was really struck when you said that in the, I, please correct me if I didn't get this uh, right. Did you say that in the last 25 years, we've used 50% of our oil supplies? 50% of everything we've burned up to oh this point. And my question was, do you know what percentage of that would be the military? Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think it's that high, you know, really. It's 3 or 4% in the United States, maybe. I gather in the US that 50% of the U.S. budget or more goes to the military, and that That's they say true. the military is the largest polluter. True. So I just, you know, with all the planes, yeah. things, I just kind of wondered if you had that. No, I remember Thanks. being in Kosovo. I, w I went in with the UN uh, K-4s and uh, UN, you know, the Russian, <coughs> Italian, French, German, American. Can it, was Canada there? I don't know. Anyway, um, po possibly. Uh, but anyway, you know, to go into Kosovo to, you know, free it from the Serbians, and and I was stunned. These convoys are coming up from Macedonia. These these big Bradley fighter vehicles that got two miles per gallon, and and there was these huge tankers behind them carrying gas. They got two miles per gallon too. And <laughs> for the Bradley fighters, you know, it was just, it was the most hysterical thing you've ever seen. They were so armored that they moved at a snail's pace, and this was the modern military, you know, it, and so, yeah, the modern military, though, in the United States is actually the, probably the biggest funder now uh, of uh, research into renewable energy, of, of, the, of the stuff that's far out, not the stuff that's incumbent. 
Um, yes. I, I just so want to welcome you to uh, British Columbia. Thank you. I, um, my community has been turned on uh, since your early writings in Coevolution Quarterly and the Whole Earth Review um, for many years. Uh, at one point, we talked about forests and uh, selective logging up in Edmonton at the Tiger Rescue Network, one of those organizations. Yes. One of the other organizations that uh, just recently I connected with, uh, and I chose their button tonight just because uh, I, I find it uh, so um, interesting and it inspired my question, is Gen Y, Generation Y, W-H-Y. And <laughs> what's um, uh, so interesting for me, I'm just going through the emotions of seeing many Gen Y's um, efforts in New York, as well as in our own city, as well as in many places around the world, um, just be stomped on. And I wonder when that question from that generation uh, and with what they see and what um, they um, can feel is, is coming. Um, I'm wondering how do we need to respond? How can we respond? to that question, those painful questions uh, that have inspired some of the, the, uh, the anger that's there? Well, from, from when, when we were involved with civil rights and anti-war um, movement, we were a Gen Y, you know, we were young and, and, um, and we were radicalized by violence towards us. I mean, radicalized, I don't mean in a sense of being violent in turn, I mean radicalized in terms of, in a sense, plumbing the depths of the ignorance and the appointed hatred, I call it appointed hatred, you know, delegated hatred, you know, because that's what police do. They may carry it as well, but, you know, they're, they're basically in instruments, you know. <laughs> and um, so for me, I, I'm not so worried about it. I feel like, okay, you know, check it out. That's, yeah, that's, that's how power works. And it isn't pretty, and it's not workable. Uh, I'm not talking about peacekeeping and about police in general and the function of police. We need police, no question about it. But I'm talking about the, the, um, the, the control of whether the military or police forces in order to institute a status quo, to institute the, um, uh, to, to in a sense to marginalize um, the questions uh, and uh, the, this, this telling truth to power, you know. And so I, I hate to, s it's not like I want to see anybody hurt. That's horrific to me. Um, but, but at the same time, I feel like you know, like what David's saying about a fever, I feel like the, pr the provocation that is not a provocation because it's really young people who are s there's so much authenticity and sincerity and goodwill, you know, there, so much, you know. And to see it being treated brutally and callously and so forth, it, I don't think it's going to change their sincerity, but it's going to change their tactics. It's going to change their mobility. It's going to change how they mobilize. It's going to change how they organize, and I think this is this sort of the this sort of symbiosis is 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 actually healthy for the movement. Is that probably not the answer you expected? But I actually, <laughs> I'm not eschewing. I'm 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 not condoning violence. And I'm sh I'm eschewing it, but I'm just saying, is that it's there, it's there, and if we, I want to say one more thing. And I kind of recommend to everybody, which is, I, I recommend that we all be hopeless, hope less, give it up, give it up, because hope is just, it's, it's intimate with fear. You can't have hope without fear. And what we need now is fearlessness, because the, what we face is so extraordinary, and so what happens to me in that radicalization of a generation is fearlessness. It arises. And it can't arise if you're afraid of what's going to happen to you or to others. And what the blessing is, 
that, and I don't mean this in sort of a Hollywood way, but I'm going to say it, you know, that there are things that we have discovered that are worth dying for. And if you know, uh, if you have that in your life, then you're fully alive. So, thank you. <laughs> Make... I'm making some jottings as I stubbornly stick to my own theme that I put out earlier. Um, <laughs> some of the things that I've heard tonight already that we can leverage to create a better world. Sorry. <laughs> I got way out track. Innate, the innate knowledge that you're part of a community, mm. um, which uh, Paul referenced early in his talk. Leverage your access rights. Leverage all the energy and goodwill and, yes, even the anger of Gen Y because of the pisser of a situation they find themselves in. Um, if you're Gen Y, you have, I guess you reach down inside and you find that and you use it. And if you're not Gen Y, then you, you try to be of help as a mentor or a supporter or an opportunity maker for Gen Y. Uh, leverage the awareness that the military has that fossil fuels are finite. Who knows, maybe the military will help us get from here to there in a strange way. <laughs> and uh, leverage um, having fear in order to find hope. No, that's not what I said. No? <laughs> not what I said. <laughs> leverage no. your awareness of get, fear? Forget about hope, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Hope is a bad headache. It is a hanger on. It is, it, uh, it sanctions fear. Ah, okay. Well, I'm glad I came back to that. Yeah, I'm glad you did too. <laughs> I said, be hopeless. Get rid of it. it How many people got that the first time? <laughs> okay, I'll see that. I'll see that. I'm, I'm so grateful to you guys. Uh, but I want to say something about leverage. Get what you pay for. I want to say something huh? about leverage, which is that <laughs> the, way, the way you heal a system. The way you heal the system was an ecosystem, immune system, social system, is you connect more of it to itself. The healing is innate in the system. It's not out there. So this is what we're talking about. I mean, the social entrepreneurs, the social technologies, Van City, this is what we're talking about, the transparency. We're talking about a system hooking up, connecting to itself. And that's how you heal, and that's how you transform. I'm glad that we got that clarified. I, I, would have, I would have gone forth and confused people for the next 10 years. Can I have a question from you? Yeah. So this thing uses a lot of energy, and I don't think we need it. Mic check. Mic check. <laughs> Mic check. <laughs> Mic check. <laughs> My name is Aaron. My name is Aaron. <laughs> I'm a permaculture teacher. I'm a permaculture teacher. <laughs> <laughs> At least what I'm doing in the Occupy movement is not about what we talk about. I think it's about changing how we talk. So my question is, in this global movement of micro-movements, how do you see <laughs> See, when the media tries to describe Occupy, can you see how wrong it gets it? <laughs> um, well, I'm going to use the same answer before. You just exemplified it. You, you just exemplified, you answered your own question. A and I mean that sincerely. 
there's nothing I could say that would be remotely as eloquent as you were in how you said it, what you said, and the way you said it. I am going to be extremely unpopular here, but uh, I'm told that in order to keep this evening on time... You can be hopeful or what? I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I'm fearful. I'm telling you that right now. It must be this far from hope, but hope is useless or something like that. Anyway, um, I'm ashamed of my hope. Um, it's okay. There's programs for you. <laughs> There's a program for it. Um, in order to keep the evening um, within a realistic time frame, I need to invite out our, our three social entrepreneurs. But apparently, Paul is going to have everyone up to his hotel room afterwards. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, if I could ask you to just have a seat here. And if, if you would um, like to listen, I think you might hear some interesting ideas for your yeah. next book. And if you'd like to participate, that would be fantastic, too. We'd love Thank to have you do that. So um, if I could invite out the, the three social entrepreneurs who are going to complete our evening. Um, we'll have Mark Brand, who's leading the uh, renovation and preservation, maybe the reincarnation of Save on Meats. Uh, Louise Schwartz, who is the guiding light for recycling alternatives. She has been ahead of the Enviro curve Thanks for, that. for a Thank long you. time. And Am Johal, anybody who's, not, who's involved in community activism who doesn't know Am. Am is the, the first coordinator for the Van City Office of Community Engagement at SFU Woodward. And um, I'm going to, those are my brief introductions so that you know who everybody is. And now I'm going to put a question to each of them and tell you a little bit more about each person as I go. So um, maybe we'll start with Louise. Okay. Um, Louise, uh, now you're, you have a history of local activism. I know you've been, um, helping to fight against a, a waste incinerator uh, proposal. Um, but the, the, the um, project that we wanted to hear from you tonight about is this um, green business hub that you're part of. Right. Um, now, I know that Recycling Alternative is going to join with other recyclers like Mattress Recycling to create a green mm -hmm. business hub. And as I understand it, the hub's going to include a, a number of hands-on right. green enterprises yep. involved in various aspects. Mm -hmm. um, it won't surprise you that Van City is involved in seeding this um, project, um, which means all of you who do business with Van City are helping to invest in this project as well. And so therefore, as investors, you can hear a report from Louise and, and the project you're working on. My question is, uh, could you describe is? your vision for the zero waste business hub? Yeah. So um, to the, the, the green, this waste hub, this green hub that we're looking to develop together, it's really a co-location model for a group of local businesses already working with a focus on waste reduction, waste repurposing, recycling um, in the green sector and already going. And, and some of us have been going, as we've been going for 20 years. Others have been going for certainly 10, the last 10 years or so. And um, we are looking to co-locate ourselves with some community organizations that have a similar type of focus and employment agencies uh, in the inner city that uh, we've worked with over the years in developing our inclusive employment um, practices to come under one roof together, a very big roof together. And the idea really was born out of our experience over the last 20 years at Recycling Alternative, working in this field of uh, trash busting, waste reduction, and working with a lot of other community organizations like the Vancouver Biodiesel Co-op that we helped develop. Um, this summer we're working with Farmers Market and doing a food scraps collection pilot, creating drop spots at the Farmers Market in the West End. And um, also these employment agencies as well as our other colleagues and friends who work in other similar 
uh, waste reduction, trash, bushing, trash busting businesses, and we realized that there were a number of synergies uh, that we have, and we had a great opportunity to create to, to, uh, a great platform to start to cross connect um, all these myriad waste streams that we're dealing with. So. Fabio and mattress recycling, or the, the guys from Cowichan that are coming to Vancouver to look at recycled biodiesel and that. So um, with that, um, we began to really look at our synergies and things like we all operate in rather large spaces. We all need to operate in light industrial areas in the city. We all operate with a lot of equipment, bailers, forklifts, loading bays, trucking. And so we started to um, think about how we could come in and collaborate to share this type of a model and create something really innovative. And particularly because, as you mentioned, we have to start to bring all this stuff home. Our economy, our local, what we're doing with our waste has to start to come back close to us. And with this, we're hoping to be able to um, cross-connect the various streams, what we can do with them. And one of the things we all have in common is uh, the, the nature of our work is so labor-intensive, we have a lot of jobs. So this is this partnership, this opportunity to work with um, employment opportunities in the inner city to create real hands-on green-collar jobs, opportunities for training and skills development. And uh, so this was the... This is the model that we're looking at. We're looking, at, we need light industrial. There's light industrial very close to the center of Vancouver, which mm -hmm. would be perfect um, as far as its proximity. And as we started to develop this model and presented it to Van City, really they, they came on board and really started to help us uh, look at hammering out the financial uh, details of this, the feasibility of it, of a co-location like this, and what this involves. All of these are independent businesses that will continue carrying on. And so our expertise in recycling alternative, but also these other businesses and community orgs, um, is to innovate and find new ways to deal, in our particular cases, with waste and the problem of waste. Mm -hmm. And really that expertise as far as building a solid, robust economic model that involves this many parties was, is one of the challenges. And Van City's helped us now push ourselves to that next stage, which is building the solid business plan. How does that look with that many partners coming in to um, what, deal what, with waste locally right here? And, and here I'm just trying to get to kind of the essence of, of, of a sustainable philosophy of business rather than create uh, an advertisement for Van City. But my question would be, yeah. when you decided you wanted to get this kind of financial advice and yeah. backing, did you go to a lot of different banks or, or, or did you think that, that the credit union w model was probably the way to go? Yeah, without, well, I mean, that's who we bank with. You know, that's who uh -huh. knows us and that's who we would have the opportunity to start to present this sort of thing with. I'm just um, wondering what kind of re reaction, reception you might have gotten if you'd gone to one of these giant banks based in New York, whose motto might be leverage toxins instead well, of, uh, there you, go. you know, I don't know. instead of do something about you toxins, know. you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. Yeah. It's back to yeah. this local thing. We're wanting, yeah. we're collecting this trash right here. We want to yeah. be processing and dealing with it right here right. with local jobs right here. So I think that was th th that convergence. Thank you. And so... Having made that strange circuit around Vancouver with various bits of e-waste and what have you, and going to one and saying, and having people say, we take that but not that, and realizing that I'd actually burned more hydrocarbons trying to drive my junk around than actually, I'd, I'm really looking forward to this Just hub. Just come I think to the one stop. Idea. So Am Johal and I first met when he was um, pioneering indie media in Vancouver in a little, little, uh, office and uh, it was right after Seattle when Indie Media was starting so it must have been a good I don't know 10 or 20 or 15 years ago right yeah I think you're thinking of a different guy no no I ran, I ran into you no no it was you and um, <laughs> you just I wish I did I support them I too much time did. has too much time has elapsed apparently um, but uh, this summer SFU Woodward began offering programs in fine arts and cultural democracy, tuition free to inner city residents um, through SFU's new Van City Community Engagement Office. And uh, 
on offer from Simon Fraser University. There is a six-week lecture series called Introduction to Cultural Democracy and a six-week fine arts course in the works. Um, just to give you a flavor of some of, the, some of the exciting stuff going on there in the works is also a program being designed on arts and entrepreneurship. So Am is the first coordinator for the Van City Office of Community Engagement, and he'll be leading uh, SFU's charge to engage with the community through arts. And so I'm just wondering, Am, um, how does Woodward's contribute to the landscape of cultural sustainability? I think one of the things to, to note and to acknowledge is that uh, for some people in the city, Woodward's is viewed as the model mixed-use development, and there's certainly uh, large criticisms of that as well, and that some people view it as the beachhead of gentrification. And so it's a loaded, politicized context uh, to be working in. And to do community engagement well, it needs to be rooted in environmental justice and social justice. And uh, it also means sometimes challenging uh, the difficulties of working within a large institution. And when I first started work, uh, it took uh, almost 10 months to get the front door of SFU open to the public. It's very difficult to do community engagement when the front door is uh, closed to the public. Um, I think some of the, the, the You're not speaking are, metaphorically here. No, no. The front door is, was locked. It was, yeah. it was literally <laughs> locked. You had to go around the other side. And when we did, <laughs> when, when we uh, did uh, pilot some uh, programs initially uh, last year, we were working with Jim Green and Opera Breve to start some free uh, opera classes as part of uh, Introduction to Cultural Democracy. And, uh, you know, we let our security know we're going to be um, uh, starting this class and just to make sure, you know, there weren't going to be any issues. And, uh, of course, there was, everything was going fine. The opera singers were there. People were having a great time. And uh, when some of our students went to the second floor uh, to go to the bathroom, uh, one of the students uh, saw someone from the downtown Eastside community immediately walked over to the security guard and said, excuse me, that man is going upstairs. And the security guard looked back at the student and said, yeah, he's here for the opera. <laughs> so I, I think when we think about capacity building and community development, uh, there's a lot of capacity building to do, including within the own institution, with students and all of that. And I think what we're trying to do and leverage uh, the assets of this place is that we've done uh, public conversations with Pivot Legal Society. We've partnered with Megaphone Magazine, the street paper, to start an introduction to citizen journalism class uh, right out of our boardroom, which is very different than the uh, corporate bookings and these types of things that are part of the the contemporary uh, public university. We also, in negotiating uh, with uh, artists who are coming in, people like Margie Gillis, they don't just do two or three shows and leave town. Negotiated into their contract is a workshop uh, that they do with inner city residents. So Margie Gillis actually did a workshop uh, it, with uh, a group of women from the downtown east side as part of being here. So if we can leverage the professional arts, if we can build in community tickets to what we do, uh, when we're running our programs, we will uh, uh, purchase our food from Potluck. So we're able to use, utilize this office and the potential to create uh, some community in a very uh, politicized context. And I think part of our curatorial position, uh, knowing that these conversations about what that space is and what it means, is to simply embrace that controversy and think of it as a public good. Because if we're going to have a nurtured public sphere in the city, it means we can bring those difficult conversations in. We've brought in people like Kai Nagata, who quit his job as a journalist in Quebec and was living in his dad's backyard in a tent. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we have Dr. Glenn Coulthard speaking, who's a radical Fanon scholar. He grew up in the Northwest Territories. He's going to be talking about resentment in indigenous politics. I think we can utilize this space and build community, acknowledge the politicization that's there, and we can build uh, something really beautiful from that. I like <laughs> I mean, what I hear there that, that's exciting is, is an, an, an open invitation, now that the front door is unlocked, an open invitation <laughs> for an ongoing conversation about change in the downtown east side. And uh, we know that the downtown east side is, not, is a dynamic neighborhood, always has been, has never been static, has always been subject to economic forces, social forces, 
really powerful structural forces coming to bear on that community. So Woodward's is not the first new entity to arrive on the scene and exert some forces for change, positive and some would say dicey. But what you're saying is, let's have the conversation. And you have resources that can be leveraged to make things better in the downtown east side. So I, I like hearing that that conversation is underway. That's great. Um, and then the third person we have here is Mark Brand. And Mark Brand, as I said, is, uh, is uh, the man behind uh, Save on Meats. We were mourning the loss of Save on Meats at the Taiyi because we were a short walk from Save on Meats. And then um, everyone's excited because it's back again and it's fantastic. Um, Mark and his company, Mark Brand, received uh, a half a million dollars from Van City uh, in November to back his proposal to reopen the historic Save on Meats property on West Hastings. Um, it's a cavernous four-story, 22,000 square foot building that still sports its landmark pair of uh, neon penny-pinching pigs. I don't know if people know that. And it, they've been there since 1957. I'm as old as those pigs, mm -hmm. almost exactly. So uh, Save on Meats is a business that also provides meals to people on the downtown east side. And it has a rooftop garden. I know where you want to grow uh, some produce that you use in the restaurant. And you employ people from the neighborhood. And I know that you actually have a relationship with, uh, with uh, Louise's group. And uh, maybe we can hear a little bit about that too. Um, because I'm sure that story goes a lot uh, to, to illustrate what Paul's talking about, this really fine grain horizontal network that is, that is taking the place of what was a very vertical top-down way of organizing the economy. Anyway, Mark, I'm wondering if you could describe the community partners who are involved in, in your Save on Meats project and how you've merged a for-profit business model with community services such as uh, the meal program for low-income folks. Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, and you were right about my relationship with Louise. We certainly do go back since the doors opened. She's taught me a much better way to deal with the thousands of pounds of bone and, and meat, of course, that come out of the building, mm -hmm. which has trickled down into other businesses in the neighborhood via me bragging about it um, and mm -hmm. people generally just saying, oh, really? Okay, we could do that. <laughs> but I guess what I wanted to start with a little bit is this also this thought of consciousness and, and people being within a community and just because of their, their locale to each other, being able to see each other all day, and uh, Am and I see each other pretty much every other day. And the conversations that are sparked there within is how a lot of my partnerships have formed. Um, some of them are forced upon you because of the, your operation in the neighborhood itself, but just a forced conversation, like you should talk to this person, and this person has something that you would probably be interested in. And one of our great partners is the Potluck Cafe that Am just mentioned directly across the street from us. And Heather O'Hara and Joanna Lee there have been showing me how to deal more delicately with employment and employment with people with challenges and barriers. My background is definitely not in a social uh, or not-for-profit business model. I'm a restaurateur first. Um, we have a gallery and we're involved in, in the arts as well. But because I was uh, spending all of my time the last seven years in the East Van in the downtown east side, I just, I felt that there was something that we could do that would be bigger and better, and was waiting for an opportunity to do that. Save on Meats was the obvious opportunity. As soon as we found out that it uh, was closing its doors, its doors rather, it, it struck me really strongly, and I wasn't sure immediately why either. You know, it just, it hit me right in the stomach. And I had shopped there, and I'd eaten there when I didn't have very much money, and always felt the real sense of community within the space that you don't feel in a modern grocery store or a, a modern store in general. That sort of encompassed within the community and all of the different not-for-profits working there. When we decided that we were going to take on this venture with great friend and uh, investor Michael Emmett, along with this massive help from Van City, people came out of the woodwork, and a lot of them aggressively, I will say. And... <laughs> weren't real stoked that the guy with the fancy restaurant was taking over Save on Meats. We had many, many conversations after that about what our actual intentions were, and our actual intentions changed day to day by these conversations as well. 
um, some of them from introductions by Louise herself. What we've been able to accomplish in this last year with the help from Van City is we employ over 55 people in the building right now that are local, but not necessarily just at risk residents. It's also students and it's people who just were down on their luck, single moms, and they all work together in this space for one goal, and that goal is to feed the community and be part of it in its revitalization. And all of them are on the same page, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. The other portion of it is that they're learning and teaching everybody else in the building about their own initiatives and what they're trying to, everybody's got their own one that they grab onto, right? Oh, okay, I don't think we're doing enough of this recycling. I think that you said we were gonna do this generator and what's happening with it and why aren't we burning our fat? And we get hit with a lot of questions every day, which is the whole point. The whole point is to be having this conversation within this space and getting to our goals together, not individually. So it's become this real monster for us of, of a conversation piece. And that's what we really are focusing on now is the conversations it creates in the building. Because the dichotomy of people in there is, it's unbelievable who is there. I'll finish real quickly with a story about the spot. When we were about to open, I was extremely nervous that I hadn't done enough outreach and Nicole and I hadn't spoken to enough groups and the Carnegie was gonna march on me and, you know, you have these real thoughts, that's, that's real. I don't know what's gonna happen. So the roller doors come up and of course, there's a hundred people out there that are clapping and they come inside and they rush the shop and they don't know what side's which and where the grocery counter is and what's happening, but they're all from the community. And I realized later that evening with Nicole, I said, this had nothing to do with us to begin with. This was just about opening something that people loved and remembered. It's got, it's, it's their community, it's their space, and they'll use it as such. And without the help of the Louise's of the world and the Heather O'Hara's of the world, and of course, Van City, we never would have got there for sure. So, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> So, so I made a few more notes. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, all three of you have in common is you're leveraging shared physical space. Um, I know that at the Taiyi, we, we're, we're fortunate we have just a smidgen more space than we need, so we have a few extra people come in and have desks there and do, they actually have their own businesses but by the fact that they're on the edge of the Taiyi, we're just so enriched by their presence. And I think that's the model of the future, which is different people who have related but separate, but different activities being in the same physical space. I mean, I'm, I've, I'm, I love Skype and everything, but I think as Mark was saying, the reason you're making a go of it is all those face-to-face -face conversations. So you leveraged face-to-face -face relationships. Um, leverage cultural creativity. Um, and see it as, as an asset, as a value, not just as a frivolous entertainment, but something vital. And uh, leverage um, historical resonance, right? I mean, if you had just put up a neon sign of a pig that no one had ever seen, I'm not sure they would know what to make of it, but, bec but because that has resonance to people. Um, Paul, is there anything you've heard in this little bit that you wanted to, to uh, reflect on? Uh, just a few brief comments. One, um, <clears throat> so it's about uh, zero waste. The, 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 the term cradle to cradle did not come from uh, Bill McDonough and Michael Braungart. It came earlier uh, than that from a Swiss economist named Walter Stahel. Mm -hmm. And he um, was um, chartered by the EU at the time to look at chronic unemployment. Yeah. Right. Because in Europe, the employment laws are really cool, but at mm -hmm. the same time, they kind of actually act as a disincentive to hire because mm -hmm. once you're hired, you have a lot of rights. Mm -hmm. And um, and they're running about 12%. This was in the 80s, uh, uh, unemployment, and it was it was hardcore. They couldn't get it down. And his work as an economist discovered that in the primary economy, primary extractive industries. Uh, use very few people, it's very capital intensive, but once you go to the tertiary economy, which is recovery, it flips, yeah. and you reduce your capital expenditures yeah. by 75%, yeah. and you triple or quadruple your employment. Yeah. 
And so this is, again, about making the connection, closing the loop, plugging the leaks, really, yeah. is, which is what you're doing. Yeah. And, 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 and furthermore, by being there, what happens is then you can actually be a force for getting people to design the waste so that the waste is yes. more valuable. Yeah. Because our waste stream wasn't designed to be recycled. And yeah. now we are. And so there is, again, that process. Yeah. Culturally, what, what came up for me um, was the Hillman comment which is uh, when culture dies, nature dies. And, and we have this sort of illusion in the West that there's wilderness and there's culture, but really the West came to uh, the Americas that had been highly cultured by peoples for thousands and thousands of years. And the best agronomists in the world were in the Americas and produced amazing food and, and so forth. So, that the, 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 what we're talking about is cult culture is the very heart and base of what we're talking about, without which uh, there is nothing whatsoever. So restoring and remitting culture to me is so, so important. And it is what we're doing tonight and what you guys are doing uh, in your activity. Um, uh, and lastly, it touches with food because when I said bring the money home, but we've got to bring our taste buds home too because our taste buds were colonized as well. And only an industrial company could make something taste the same forever. And <laughs> nature doesn't work that way. <laughs> and everything tastes different forever. And our taste buds are this magnificent gateway to our immune system and to our evolution. And we have this amazing quality in our mouth that says, me, me, oh, that's a not me. It's amazing, it's like that. Yes, and we judge and so forth. And that eloquence, that, that discernment is lost when food is colonized by industrialism. And to bring back the food, not only its locality, but also its diversity and taste and texture and so forth, is really part of building, it's called agriculture for a reason. It's mm -hmm. part of building culture. And so that those are the three things that occurred. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, now. Question for anybody who would, who would want to answer that. Well, let's take back another, another favorite phrase of the hedge fund managers, um, uh, high yield investment. Let's take back that phrase. Um, and let's for a minute. I mean, we know that money was involved in all of these enterprises and, that, and also some savvy financial advice. But I'm wondering if each of you just could look at your own personal stories a bit and think of a moment when somebody made an investment in you other than money that you see the results really bearing fruit today in, what, in, in the projects that you actually described. Was there any moment in your life where somebody did that? Anyone want to go first? Sure, I'll take okay. this one. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> uh, for me, it's your staffer or your manager or that person that, that takes over and takes ownership of what, what is going on, and you can see your actual vision through them. And you see it differently, and it can be exceptionally, you know, tear you down a little bit when you're trying to mm -hmm. start something that doesn't have necessarily mm -hmm. a blueprint and that doesn't have just one answer, but to have those people around you that then re-energize and, and invest into your train of thought while helping to manipulate it to, to get to where it needs to. Um, and I've had, on this particular project, literally a dozen people like that who have just invested themselves emotionally, physically to the point of yeah. exhaustion and illness uh, to make sure that this thing got done. And I'm lucky I've got a few of them in the audience with me here tonight just to watch that sort of dedication that mm -hmm. allows you to never drop the ball. It wants to make you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go through this regardless of how difficult it is. And yeah, the value of an amazing employee or a person or a partner is a better word. Uh, a partner who just has, yeah, like I said, encompassed that vision. There is, there's no greater resource. You can get money, but that's, that's not something that you can purchase ever. And Aside from your innate charm and, and charisma, what do you think it is about the project itself that brings that out of people, that, that causes them to invest so much passion that they might not in, in another kind of job? They want to help. 
Yeah. I think it's really just as simple as that sentence. Yeah. I don't think there's anything else there. These people will also live in the neighborhood yeah. or live in Vancouver. So yeah. you're visibly, like this is, you're aware of this as not, I don't, I don't like to yeah. use the word problem, but you're aware of the downtown east side. Right. And so if you can do something, yeah. then you're going to. So they're a bit like those antibodies that are rushing to the, the part of the body that needs the help. They just know to do it, and they want to they wanna sustain. Am, did you have yeah, a uh, quick story like me, that? For uh, me, sort of, this was around the um, late 90s at the time, and uh, we had gotten a, uh, a friend of mine, I had read a, an article in Harper's Magazine about a, a program in New York, and we uh, applied for a fund uh, we did a four or five page proposal and we got $15,000 approved and we uh, started uh, 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 the process of organizing uh, a program that was uh, uh, called Humanities 101 at, at UBC where residents of the downtown east side go out to UBC. And uh, at that time, um, uh, I didn't uh, know a lot of people in the downtown east side. I'd hung out uh, a little bit, knew a few people and we were helped out by a huge community of people. Uh, in the neighborhood that allowed us to do workshops and community meetings and this notion of uh, the fact that people would go all the way out to UBC, we weren't mm -hmm. actually going to do the, the program here. And uh, by initiating that, we were able to also challenge the institution that, you know, we had to talk to the head librarian and say, well, you give us library cards, even though these are not officially UBC students. So everyone did a little nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and broke the official <laughs> rules of the university <laughs> and allowed us to uh, establish uh, something. And, and uh, for me, that type of experience as well led to uh, further work uh, in and around the neighborhood on the Vancouver Agreement and politics and other mm. types of things. And I've uh, learned uh, so much uh, about this neighborhood and it's given me so much that I, I, I'm just uh, grateful to be still uh, be engaged in the, in the work still. Great, mm. thanks. Louise, Jim? Well, I, I was thinking of Mark's thing, you know, with work. I, I guess I'd have to say my business partner, Robert Weatherby, showed a great deal of faith in me when in 1989 I was um, running around in a hatchback and schlepping paper in and out of people's offices before recycling was really mainstream. And I would find myself in elevators in these huge towers downtown. You know, I was doing things like stripping an entire building of its paper, you know, <laughs> at Burrard and Robson by myself or if I could get my brother or someone to come and running into friends in the elevators and they'd be saying, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm doing this recycling thing. You know, I'm <laughs> obsessed with this <laughs> trash busting. Because it really had, I just had had this epiphany about garbage. I just couldn't believe we had this throwaway term that was so untrue. And really, um, at that point, um, I had just been going for a few months and um, Robert, who's also a dear friend of mine, had moved back from the UK, and uh, he said, you know, I think I should help you with this. <laughs> and really, that was one of the, the epiphany was a turning point, and so was him becoming involved in this project, because I, we would not be here, because I was sort of at the level of hatchbacks and, you know, <laughs> hands-on stuff, and he, you know, he's able to sort of have that, what I call the mechanical engineering sort of background vision. And so I would say that was someone who, I felt at that time was pivotal in helping us move forward. And so expertise and, and just belief and that you're not crazy. There Invest you go. <laughs> investment in faith. What are you doing? Faith. <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't cost any money to have faith in somebody, but it can make the difference apparently. Yeah. And Paul, did you want to? Add anything? I think I've said enough tonight. I, yeah. I love listening to these people. It's a nice way to end. <laughs> well, now I have to confess that um, I, I believe it falls to me to bring the evening to a close. But I've been wrong all night. Um, <clears throat> strikes me that somebody from Van City might like to come out here and make the whole thing in. But, but if not... Here comes someone. Uh, that's what, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So I was thinking <clears throat> I would introduce Tamara Vrooman and say, why don't you, uh, why don't you close yeah, the evening but, for us? But you've been doing such a great job, <laughs> David. Um, uh, I, I do get the, the best jobs of the evening, thanking, uh, thanking Paul and now thanking David, Mark, 
um, and Louise for their, their candor and their humor uh, and their commitment uh, to creating a community that's vibrant, resilient, inclusive, uh, and sustainable. And so please join me in once again uh, thanking Paul, thanking Louise, Am, Mark, and David for their comments and their generosity this evening. Thank you. Fantastic comment. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank I you. don't know why you kept me separate. Thank you. Know, you. Kept, me, kept me a chair. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your books. I just loved them two weeks ago. It was fantastic. Thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Elizabeth Geller, one of our dedicated uh, and passionate staffers at Van City, for organizing this event. And here, here. And on behalf of our board of directors, our staff, and the 400,000 uh, people in our community that we're proud to serve as members of Van City, we also want to thank all of you. You know, this event this evening was um, by donation. We wanted to make sure that it was open and accessible to the community that we serve. And I'd like to announce and congratulate the 1,500 of you that chose to spend some time with us this evening. Uh, together, you raised uh, $21,800 towards the Van City Community Foundation, uh, whose mission is better together. Good night, and thank you very much. All right. Definitely soon.